Hello fellow translators. Today I'm going to do something a bit different just because I can. It is, uh, it's been a while since I've discussed some of the books that I've been reading and so I wanted to discuss some of the books that I've been reading. I'm going to talk about the books I've been reading more or less over the last month. Without any further ado, let's get started. So the first book that I'm going to start with, I'm going I guess in chronological order from what I read I was reading a month ago. This is the this one, Overlooked Historical uh, Records of the Three Korean kingdoms. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is in, uh, for you Korean scholars out there, this is the Samguk Yusa, the English kind of translation of, uh, of Samguk Yusa, I guess, and what they call it in English. So in um, Korean history, you have the Samguk Sagi and Samguk Yusa, which were two of the main uh, historical records of antiquity that were written in antiquity and, uh, and then held on. Like this was originally written in what you want to say in the 1500s, but I think it was earlier than that. Anyway, it was written a while ago and it has a collection of, this is mostly like legends and, uh, and anecdotes and stuff like that. I found it quite interesting. It has a lot of stories that probably took, are quite familiar to Koreans. I'd certainly heard of a couple of them before. The notes that I took basically mark down where it talks about certain things, like about King Taejung, about the downfall of Pekche, about uh, the founding of Koguryo, about uh, the Buyo kingdom. Uh, what else? Uh, Koguryo, I have uh, certain interesting things like animal blood was applied to human mouths for oaths. That's weird. Um, and uh, blah, blah, blah. So uh, yeah, I did enjoy it a lot just because every now and then I like to delve into these things and uh, read about, um, you know, it's just a collection of stories and legends and stuff from, uh, you know, from the founding of Korea and from early times in Korea. And every now and then I like delving into things like this. So that's what I did. So actually, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm not going to include the audiobooks that I've been listening to. I'm just going to include the books that I've been reading just in the interest of time. So uh, the next one is Giacometti. This is a book I came across at a used bookstore. Where was it? I think in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, it was available there for six bucks. And so I thought I should get it. Being Swiss, Giacometti is on... Uh, his, his sculpture is very well known in Switzerland. In fact, his sculpture is... Um, on the 100 Swiss franc bill, I believe, uh, one of his sculptures. And uh, the Giacometti brothers were well known. His, uh, this is Alberto Giacometti. His brother Diego was known for, uh, I think for furniture and stuff like that. Anyway, also a sculptor. And their father was also a, uh, an artist. But uh, so very artistic family. This is a biography, big biography of his. I didn't even know it existed until I saw it in the bookstore and I decided to read it. Here is a good quote. This was said by, uh, Jean Genet, and he said, Giacometti is not working for his contemporaries, nor for the future generations. He's creating statues to at last delight the dead. It sounds a bit out there, but, uh, you know, Giacometti was a bit out there. It's, uh, he was a very talented man. He's from Switzerland originally, from Grigioni, like a small town in the valley there, uh, Italian speaking. Uh, but he went to Paris, and he lived in Paris throughout, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and so it's, the whole book is actually a look into the artistic life of Paris during the, those times. Picasso, he was a friend of Picasso's, Jean-Paul Sartre, and uh, he was a very odd character. And so, yeah, what, what else do I say about it in my review? I say, yeah, these days he would be diagnosed with severe OCD probably and put on some sort of medication. Um, but probably, actually, I think, thinking about it, he probably would have refused the medication anyway. Um, which is a good thing because it gave us, I mean, he suffered a lot and uh, he had his own issues, definitely. But uh, he also gave us the art that he gave us and, uh, and it took a lot out of him to do so. Uh, so the author seems very, very knowledgeable, sometimes suspiciously so, about his life. Also because certain, certain things, this is the author right here with a portrait of the author by Giacometti here, but not once does the author mention himself in this story or his portrait. And so I kind of wonder where he fits in to this whole story. There are also some weird things, like he talks about Caroline, who was uh, his mistress. While he was married, he was very open about his mistress, but it says her real name doesn't matter. He says it in the book, and I don't see why he said, I mean, either we know it or we don't. It's weird that in a biography he would say the real name doesn't matter, but fine. Um, and uh, also, what else did I mention? Oh, yeah, there's certain other things. Here I live in Charlotte. The Bechtler Museum has a lot of Giacometti because everyone says Hans Bechtler, the guy who, who made the museum, was a good friend of Giacometti's. He only gets one mention in the book where he says he, he 
actually passed on buying Giacometti's. So I don't know how that happened. He, he must have bought it later. Also, it doesn't talk about any follow-up, like what happened to Annette? What happened to the wife? What happened to, uh, to Caroline? What happened to uh, Giacometti's brothers? Because, you know, uh, they, were, they didn't get along, all these people. And Giacometti was kind of the glue keeping them together. And as soon as he dies, not to mention, well, he earned quite a bit of money. And so they're going to have to deal with the will and testament and all that. Anyway, but there's no follow-up as to what happened to any of these characters or what happened uh, to, you know, to his assets and everything after he died. Uh, by the way, I went to uh, Google Maps and his, the place where he lived most of his life in Paris is actually not very well kept at all, which is too bad uh, because I think uh, it's, he's an important artist and it will be an important thing. But that's it for that book. Let's move on. So my next book is Silas Marner by George Eliot. This is my first George Eliot. I know Middle March, I think, is probably uh, her most famous book. But uh, I thought I'd give this a go. I got it for, as you can see, $1.25. It was in the bargain bin at my local used bookstore. And I thought I'd try it out. And actually, I liked it. Uh, it took me a while to get into it, I guess, because kind of old-fashioned writing and whatnot. It's from the mid-1800s. Uh, but uh, after a while, I did get into it. I liked it. It's a cutesy story. It has, you know, a happy ending, all that, which I don't mind. And uh, it is um, a scathing rebuke, let's say, of industrialization, which... Dickens notwithstanding, you don't get very much of in the writing of these times. And so uh, I appreciated, I, I, I thought it was quite interesting the way it was put in this story and, uh, and the way it worked. And I mean, it's just a cute little story, really. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if you, if, if, if you come across it, you have some time, give it a go. I'll be on the lookout for Middlemarch because I have not read that. And, uh, and that's her most famous one. So I think it'll be interesting to read that. Moving along. So the next book is Yetruski Testimonianze di Civita. So this book, I'm pretty sure I've had it since I was a kid. I like reading about the Etruscans because my family is from Tuscany, where the Etruscans were from originally. This is quite interesting because it's actually from Perugia, so in Umbria, not in Tuscany. And, uh, and I mean, it doesn't change much, except at the end they have a section about Umbrian uh, stuff and uh, the museums in Perugia and all that, dealing with the Etrus Etrus Etruscans. I mean, my notes here basically have to do with some of the interesting factoids uh, that the Romans kept accusing the Etruscans of licenti licen li licentiousness and perversion and orgies and stuff. But this is typical for more rigid societies, the way they criticize freer societies. So we assume, we kind of assume or know that uh, the Etruscans were a lot more free than the Romans were. In fact, women attended the banquets and stuff like this, which to the Romans was crazy. Um, they knew about thermal water properties before the Romans. Uh, oh, uh, Tiberis, who's the king of Veio, um, gave his name to the Tevere, to the Tiber River in Rome. I didn't know that, but now I do. And I mean, yeah, and some other notes and all that. Anyway, I don't think you'll come across this book. Also, it's only in Italian. I don't think it's in English. Um, but if you do come across anything about the Etruscans, it's rare to come across these books not in Italian, but they are an interesting civilization. So I do recommend if you want uh, to read up about them. Moving on. The next book, On y voit rien by Daniel Arras. Um, there is actually a quote I like in it. Which actually I'm not going to read because it's all in French and I don't want to embarrass myself too much. Basically translated, it says, that which worries me is, um, is the type of essay that seems at certain moments to interpose itself between you and the work. So it, and it's kind of ironic, I thought, because I like that approach saying you shouldn't have a filter between you and the artwork and uh, you should be able to, uh, and a lot of essays act as a filter. You have to watch, see this work of art through this filter in order to understand it. It's kind of ironic that he says it because these are all commentaries on artwork. So these are filters through which to understand artwork. So um, I think it's kind of a dig almost at himself as well. But uh, he talks about certain specific artworks. Uh, one pet peeve was that these are really black and white, small copies of these artworks, which would have been a lot better had they been 
I mean, and I understand for printing purposes and all that, it's harder, but still. Uh, and, and obviously I can go online and look at the artwork, but still, I, I feel it would have made a better book if they, uh, if they made it easier to look at the artwork that he talks about. I have specific notes on each work of art. I'm not going to, uh, go into them also because they're kind of spoilers and, and mention what he talks about, but, uh, suffice it to say, he discusses Tintoretto, he discusses Velázquez, um, he discusses some other works of art and, uh, and I liked it a lot. I'm not a person who likes art in general. And, uh, but I do find it very interesting every now and then, and I found this quite eye-opening. And, uh, and so if you do come across it, I, I recommend it. Someone in the comments once before said they know Daniel Arras, and uh, he is qu a quite well-known art critic, I believe. He might be worth looking, looking into other works by him uh, talking about art. The next book is Voyage Pittoresque en Suisse Romande, en Savoie et sur les Alpes. Another one, uh, part of the, I've been reading some books in French. I think I mentioned in another video, I'm trying to maintain my French. But uh, this, again, I've had it for a long time. I got this in Cran Montana, I know, uh, because I wanted a book kind of talking about the area of the Swiss Romand. Now, growing up in Ticino, I grew up in Ticino in the, in the Swiss Italian part. So we learn about the Swiss Italian history. Why does this seem out of focus? Uh, and we also learn about the, um, the Swiss-German part, but very little about the Swiss-French part. So actually, I appreciated uh, being able to read about this and learn about more about the Swiss-French part. Usually we learn, you know, Calvin was there in Geneva, and that's pretty much it. But this talked a lot more about it. I hadn't realized until I started it that it was written in 1852. I guess the 1852 here should have been a clue. But uh, so most of the places he mentions, unfortunately, are long gone. And uh, that's really too bad. But uh, many of the places are still there. I look, I, any place that seemed interesting, I looked it up to see if it was still there and I marked it on my Google Maps places I want to visit, um, if, if it is. Uh, but uh, what else did he say? He, uh, I, I have my notes here. Yeah, I show some examples of things that have changed. Uh, he talks about certain, in, oh, interesting things. In 1479, a swarm of what are called beetles, they were probably locusts or cicadas, Kind of plagued the whole Lausanne area and ruined all the vineyards and all the crops and everything and they didn't know what to do so they took them to court and apparently they took them to court found them guilty so they were excommunicated but then there's com someone made a comment after that that said it didn't do much to help get rid of them of the cicadas but it, I thought that was kind of funny the bridge connecting the two sides of Freiburg was only built in 1834 um, if you've been to Freiburg then you know that otherwise those two sides, which apparently the city's divided. One side speaks French, the other side speaks German. So it kind of makes sense because they're very much divided. And before that bridge, I guess it was very hard to get from one to the other. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and some of the local dialects, they have words that still come from the old uh, Celtic, which I thought was interesting. Uh, but anyway, this uh, was my introduction to the Swiss Roman, the Swiss French part, and some surrounding areas, parts of France as well. I doubt you'll come across this at all. Although the guy, Amy Begin, wrote uh, about many other areas around France, but all his books are from the mid 1800s. So, I mean, if you do, feel free to read through them. I found it interesting just to read about the area, but that's pretty much it. I can't recommend it too much. Moving on. So, the next book is this one Slow Boat by. Um, Hideo Furukawa, Furukawa Hideo, I guess. And so this is a story that he, at the very end, he says it was inspired from Murakami's short story, A Slow Boat to China, which I read recently. I, it didn't really remind me of that story. I mean, sort of. It, uh, it's, it, it deals with three people of his life, but the Murakami story was three Chinese people he met in his, was three Chinese people he met in his life, yeah. And uh, the, um, they weren't, necessarily important parts of his life but here it talks about three ex-girlfriends who were very important and each one was also tied into a way where he almost got out of Tokyo but didn't and it, you kind of realize that that's kind of the whole goal of his life but he's never able to leave Tokyo. Having said that I did enjoy the book it's a short book um, you can pretty much read it in one or two settings it's an interesting story um, I had to realize before I read this that I had read a short story by him before which I liked as well they're a bit weird a bit out there but not too much and um, so if you're looking for something interesting along those lines contemporary uh, contemporary Japanese fiction then feel free to check this out slow boat by Hideo Furukawa the next book. So the next one, as you can see, I've been kind of on this kick of Korean literature. It's called Early Korean Literature. So 
selections and introductions. Um, I've had this on my wish list, I think, for over 10 years. It's just one that I read about a while ago and said, oh, I should read that and never did. So I finally ordered it. It was cheap from somewhere I can't remember. Again, use, all my books are used, by the way, almost all. I prefer used books, at, at, uh, definitely. So, and these are taken from w what I mentioned before, the Samguk Yusa and the other one, the Samguk Sagi and, and, uh, and other places. And it just has a collection of introduction from the beginning and throughout the history of, um, of early Korea, let's say, and uh, which I appreciated. So the first part is all stuff like that. And it goes through the various di dynasties, the Koguryo, Koryo, um, the uh, Chosen dynasty, stuff like that, and the different type of um, poems and literature prose that they had during that time. I enjoyed it a lot. I have uh, an example of one of my favorite poems, which I'm not going to read to you in the interest of time. Just the second half I didn't like as much. The second half is called Negotiations. If you come across this book, you can skip that, I think. These are essays that go a lot more into depth. And they're, at least for me, they're way over my head. And the, the analysis is probably good for someone who studies Korean literature for a living or is a lot more into it or a lot more knowledgeable about it than I am. Um, but uh, it, most of it was over my head. I think I absorbed very little of that second part. First part was great, though. And so if you want a brief introduction to early Korean literature, I think this is a good bet because, yeah, especially if you just take the first part, it's not that long at all. Uh, let's see. Um, here. So it's just this much. Um, anyway, that's it uh, by David McCann, Early Korean Literature. Moving on. So I'm glad, actually, that I didn't do the audiobooks because it's taking way longer than I thought. Anyway, the next one is Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, this was from my parents' place, and uh, I just had never read Breakfast at Tiffany. I've never seen the movie either, so I thought I should read it. I read recently In Cold Blood by uh, Truman Capote, the same author, and I found that very good. And so I wanted to read Breakfast at Tiffany's. I realized Breakfast at Tiffany's is fiction, In Cold Blood wasn't, but, um, but yeah, it was great. I, it's a short story, and I highly recommend it. I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm sure the movie is completely whitewashed, though, and, and made better for all audiences because there's no way they included some of the stuff in the book. The book had a lot of drugs, sex, alcohol, parties, a lot of stuff, let's say, that wouldn't be included in a movie in the, in the early 60s. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was great. Also, I had a lot of expressions that I didn't know existed back then in the 50s, like anywho and whatnot, but there you go. Um, so yeah, Breakfast at Tiffany's, you come across that book, it's, it's Breakfast at Tiffany's and other short stories, I just read Breakfast at Tiffany's, but it's a great story, you can read that also in a couple settings, probably, um, I think it was like around 100 pages, so uh, yeah, just um, definitely check it out, Breakfast at Tiffany's, I definitely recommend it, I don't have any more space for all my books, I'm glad I didn't do the audiobooks, uh, so here, the next book I have was really cool, um, Painting as a Pastime by Winston Churchill. I'm not sure why I had this on my wish list, but I did, and I ordered it, and I'm very glad I ordered it. It's really a short essay. Uh, he, it's, I think, 32 pages of text, and then the, the other part was just pictures of his paintings. By the way, the copy I have is, it, it really cost me very little, but it's, it seems rather old, from 1965. Well, I mean, old enough. Anyway, the... Um, the, it, yeah, like I said, it's basically an essay and it just talks about why he likes painting. And I have a couple quotes that I quoted in full because I really like them. I'm not going to repeat them to you in the interest of time, but um, it just uh, says why he, this is Winston Churchill, the guy who was head of state of the UK, who went to war, who did all these things, wrote huge history of the English people and stuff like that, why he really likes painting as a pastime. And I'm not a painter, but this almost convinced me. And in fact, at some point, I think it might be interesting to paint. And uh, so, yeah, I, uh, th th this was really a cute little essay. And uh, if you do come across it, I would recommend it. And Winston Churchill, I really like the way he writes, just in general. So uh, I, that is a high recommendation for me. I think I gave it five stars. Yes, I did. Moving on. So now we're finally to the last book. This is The Abbey of St. Gallen. The Abbey Library of St. Gall, sorry. So this is in St. Gallen in Switzerland. It has an abbey, which is very famous. If you're following my GeoGuessr game from recently, then you saw me. That was one of the, one of the, um, the places that I had to find. And, uh, but I, I have been to visit it already, and I really liked it. Uh, I just read this in the interest of for my next visit, because I plan on going there again, even though I've been there, I think, twice. 
uh, but uh, because I know there's a lot of stuff when you get there, you're kind of overwhelmed, you don't know what to look for, and so I thought this would help. Uh, it's too bad because a lot of the stuff that I mentioned isn't open to the public, and sometimes they rotate it so you're not sure what you're going to get. But still, um, I think it's, uh, you know, I just took notes of the stuff to, to visit or to see while I'm there. Um, I'm not sure it's worth sharing much with you. you. You can check out my Goodreads once again if you want to look into it a bit more. But suffice it to say, this has a lot of interesting stuff. Here, I, I will. it has a oldest wholly preserved um, music manuscript in the world, the Cantatorium, has the world's last surviving example of the Oracula Sibyllina, the Sibylline Oracle. Tuotilo, oh, the, uh, Tuotilo is the first known artist of what is now Switzerland. It has a bookcase that he designed. It also has the oldest, oldest existing translation of the Gospels by St. Jerome, which was written between 410 and 420 AD. And uh, this exists in like 110 different fragments. Um, anyway, cool stuff like that. And this is the Abbey of St. Gall, St. Gallen, St. Gall. This is what the Abbey more or less looks like. Uh, that was, anyway, uh, that's that book. That's the collection of my books. Just as a reminder, this is a book we're reading right now in uh, the translation book club through the language glass. It's uh, very good. It's by Guy Deutscher. Feel free to join our translation book club on Facebook. I'll leave the link down below. And, um, and yeah, that's all the books that I'm going to discuss today. Hopefully among some or a couple of them or one or two of them, you found something of interest and uh, that uh, you feel is worthwhile reading. Should probably use a screenshot of all the books for the uh, thumbnail. So let's see if I can do this. This is not going to be easy at all. And there we go. Did that work? Uh, anyway, those are the books that I've been reading. Feel free to ask me any questions you might have about them. I'm always happy to discuss those, and I will talk to you next time. Okay, thanks. Bye. Sabedum. Opla. Thank you.